Coming up, bunch of launches. Mastin wins DARPA. The low density supersonic decelerator. Plus, we are joined live by future Martian Chris Radcliffe. And we talk about Martian colonies and what they're going to look like in the future. Stay tuned. This is tomorrow. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.19 for Saturday, July 5th, 2014. I had to look at the date. I'm a terrible American. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be your hosts for this episode. Before we get started, we do want to give a huge thank you to the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this episode go. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. And I love how the list keeps getting longer and longer. And you can get more information on how you can do that at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, if $10 is a bit steep, that's okay. We have different reward levels, different levels that you can help contribute because we are a crowdfunded show and it's uh, your contributions that help us continue to do this week after week. Um, before we get into space news, stay with us for segment two. We're gonna be joined by the, <laughs> the founder of Space Up, uh, Chris Radcliffe, who will be uh, talking about Martian habitats. Mm -hmm. He's a uh, he's a cool, spacey, geeky kind of dude. So it's gonna be it's gonna be an awesome segment, uh, and that's off of a Reddit comment that we had found. So uh, let's get into space news. Uh, we have the uh, PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, via ISRO, which is the Indian Space Research Organization. This launched Monday, June thirtieth, at four twenty-two Universal Time. Check it out. One, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, plus seven, plus eight, plus nine, plus ten, plus eleven, plus twelve, plus thirteen, And off it goes. Uh, this was carrying a French commercial imaging satellite named Spot 7. It actually will be joining Spot 6 as well. It has a camera able to resolve objects on the ground as small as cars. So that's pretty cool. Assuming there's no cloud coverage. It actually also had four secondary payload for experiments for Germany, Canada, and Singapore. We had another launch this last week. It was a Delta II launch from United Launch Alliance. This happened on Wednesday, July 2nd at 0956 Universal Time. Check this one out. Three, two. Engine start. One, zero at liftoff of the Delta II rocket with OCO2. Tracking a greenhouse gas in seek of clues to climate change. Yeah, and if you're thinking Delta II, don't they mean Delta IV? Uh, no, we that's a Delta II. It's been a while. It's been like <laughs> years since we've had a Delta II launch. And uh, yeah, so rock, rock on with yourselves on that one. Uh, that launched from Space Launch Complex 2, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And at OCO number two, that's the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, you're thinking to yourself, OCO2, what happened to OCO1? Well, about five years ago, o OCO1, which is uh, launched on top of, uh, was that a Taurus, I believe? Uh, that mission was not successful, so they lost the observatory. OCO2 does the same thing as OCO1, which is to study natural man-made carbon dioxide emissions and absorption to help us assess how greenhouse gas is contributing to global warming. It's kind of like a uh, the Earth kind of has this breathing it does mm -hmm. where it will absorb carbon dioxide and kind of expel it, and we want to see how the Earth breathes in the, and out these. I, I'm oversimplifying it, but, but yeah. uh, breathes in and out these uh, these gases. Uh, we have uh, one more launch. Unfortunately, there's no video of this launch. After searching and searching and searching and searching <laughs> and searching, it's a ROCOT launch. This is from, I assume, Russia. Uh, launched Thursday, July 3rd at 12.43 Universal Time. It had a trio of messenger satellites. Uh, and that's, uh, how do you say that, GONETS? In really? Russian, G-O-N-E-T-S, GONETS, I think that's how you say that. Uh, but a trio of messenger satellites, as the name implies, they're a bunch of communication satellites for emergency services in remote areas. So that launch was successful as well. This was a cool one. This one you alerted me to. Oh, yeah. So, um, XCOR, 
um, which uh, many of us are familiar with, of course, had acquired Space Expedition Corporation. And they've got the Lynx vehicles. Check this out. They'll just roll this animation. This is what they're working on. Right. So Space Expedition Corporation, if you remember uh, last year, the Unilever X slash Lynx body spray had a promotion of sending people into space, 22 people into space. Uh, I think Buzz Aldrin was their speaker and, and whatnot. And it was all going to be on the X-Core Lynx uh, space plane. So uh, that's if that name is familiar, that's why. So Xcore has actually acquired Space Expedition Corporation, and now the Space Expedition Corporation is actually going to be over. Or, I'm sorry, is going to be known as Xcore Space Expeditions, which is kind of cool. Uh, they're using a very similar uh, logo. One has blue swoosh. One has an orange swoosh. It's very <laughs> very cool. But yeah, so uh, June 30th was the press release date. Xcore, of course, is making the Lynx suborbital space plane. And uh, yeah, no, I just thought it was kind of a, a cool thing. x sort of uh, expanding, as it were. Yeah, well, or absorbing. <laughs> uh, so this will make them, but they, what this will make them is a total solutions provider, right? So yes. they're making the, the vehicle, the suborbital space plane. They're working on that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're going to be moving on to, uh, they, they were kind of wet leasing it or, or, you know, selling to other people who would kind of lease it out. Right. Uh, now they're able to do that all themselves, exactly. essentially. And they, they've kind of. They did that by letting these other groups kind of work on that, make sure there's a market, and then absorbing those groups back into themselves. Mm -hmm. So now there'll be a single, um, very vertically integrated, right. as it were. So uh, v that's pretty cool for x like they're expanding. Buying... They're expanding like mad, too. They've got their R&D yeah. facilities opening up in Texas, and then mm -hmm. they're also working with Space Florida to do some launches down at Cape Canaveral as yep. well. Uh, and that's in addition to their offices here in California. So Rock Rock on x -Core doing some really cool things in the commercial spaceflight air arena. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see some really neat things, I think, coming out from them over the next you know decade or, or so. Easy. Uh, certainly competition to Virgin Galactic is going to be pretty cool. Competition's always good. Mastin Space Systems huge fans of Dave Mastin. Uh, they won a three million dollar yeah. three million dollar DARPA XS1 contract. That is actually harder to say than it seems. Uh, this was a uh, for a reusable first aid, check that out. This is an artist interpretation of what it's going to be. Right. And this is <laughs> this is a hilarious artist interpretation because it's a vertical takeoff, vertical landing vehicle that apparently has wings. But <laughs> well, and I, yeah, I mean, I also sort of love that. I understand that it's two different scenes that are being depicted here, but it almost makes it look like it, the, it's going to take off like a plane, flip around, and then. It, it's it smell not. its wings and then come back down. I, I don't know. So the whole thing is really sort of bizarre. This is from DARPA, by the way. This is DARPA's artist rendering of what these will look like. I think like. they didn't tell this DARPA artist anything <laughs> about this project. And they were like, can you make like a thing that goes up and comes down? Make it inspiring, like and from the uh, 1980s space shuttle era. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not Anyhow, sure laughing at the image aside, because <laughs> it's totally wrong and absolutely hilarious. Uh, the challenge is to build a reusable first stage capable of carrying and deploying an upper or second stage and that all needs to be able to send 1,300 to 2,200 kilograms of payload to orbit. Uh, and it needs to do it at less than $5 million per launch, and it needs and. to have aircraft-like operations. That doesn't mean horizontal landing and takeoff. That means it needs to be able to launch at least 10 times in 10 days. Yes. So $5 million per launch, 10 times in 10 days, uh, and then it also needs to reach Mach 10. At least once. At least once, correct. So all of these things need to happen, and if if they can pull this off, and if anyone can do VTV uh, vertical takeoff, vertical landing, it's massive. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is their thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it's like it's like DARPA said, what can? How can we give Mastin money? Uh, <laughs> Let's uh, say so, something just for them. Kind can they, of, we call it the Mastin Prize? I wonder if Armadillo Aerospace will get back in, because they did some pretty cool vertical takeoff, vertical landing stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, but Carmack was like, ooh, VR, shiny object, and, and stopped doing the space stuff. So it'd be really cool if he got back on board with the space thing. It would be like, very cool. And then controlled the vehicle through an Oculus. Oh. That's probably a terrible, because you'd want to look around idea. and the vehicle start to spin. And Where'd now, it go? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, oh, anyhow. That sounded great for a split second. Uh, for, yeah, for a moment. So the, this award, it's, uh, we believe, is it's the first of several contracts that DARPA is expected to sign for this particular program. But that's really cool. All right, moving right along, the LDSD, that's the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. Uh, we talked about this in the opening of last mm -hmm. week's show, but... Um, uh, we wanted to spend a little bit more time on it because it, it literally was like the moments before the show they were streaming this live and then we cut we did our live show yeah. so we didn't have enough time to kind of absorb all the information here you go here's a shot this was uh, all right all right we'll show it yep that's my fault 
Lock four. Burnout detected. Spin down. Spin down for the gun. Spin down confirmed. I love how we just like whack and stop. And now what you're gonna see, boom. There you go. Yeah, so what, what you were looking at is they launched the vehicle, uh, basically they took it via balloon up into like, uh, what is it? Um, I wanna say 120,000, uh, uh, I need to do my, uh, 36,000 36, meters. meters. I was like, feet, <laughs> no nope. meters, gotta do meters. Uh, so it took it, a balloon took it up to 36,000 meters and then a rocket launch and took it up an additional uh, height up to 54,900 meters uh, and it brought it up to about three point, Mach 3.8 at which point the supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, that's that thing on the outside, that big poofy thing, that inflated and they were all clapping yay, going yay because what that does, that acts as additional drag, like a big, a bigger aero surface for the vehicle to slow down in. Mm -hmm. And this is handy for places like Mars where you don't have a lot of atmosphere to actually help slow your vehicle down. So you need to increase your surface area mm -hmm. and to help you slow down so you don't you know, have a ballistic trajectory back down to the planet. So this could help us with future generation vehicles. Now, unfortunately, there was a problem and uh, there were a few different technologies they were testing. The Syed was actually a secondary technology and another secondary technology were brand new parachutes. Mm -hmm. The parachutes did not work correctly and they got tangled. And uh, sometime soon here, you'll actually hear him saying, oh, the parachutes are tangled. Oh, not there, okay. So parachutes are now tangled. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> yeah, no, not good. I mean, not you just good. see it's not inflating. It's, it's not really a surprise at that point. Yep, that's it. So it was tangled. Now, check this out. So tangled parachutes, ballistic trajectory back down to Earth. Right. They recovered the vehicle. So here we are on board the Kamana uh, this morning looking at the, the vehicle that we've managed to recover and pull out of the water. It all went perfectly. We recovered everything except for the smoke from the rockets. Everything came back and so we're really thrilled with that. It doesn't look like it's in very good shape right now, but uh, it's perfectly fine. Tomorrow we're going to start taking it apart. We're going to take the side off, take the motor out, take out the cameras, be able to extract the data from the camera recorders, which is, uh, which is also on the vehicle. Now we really want to thank everybody who was involved in this. It was a fantastic effort from the boat crews, the, uh, the Navy Explosive Ordnance Disposal guys, uh, the, the assistance from JPL, all of them did a fantastic job of spotting this stuff, getting it out of the water, um, finding all of the pieces and making sure that this didn't sink, making sure we got the parachute before it sank. Fantastic job. We're so happy with this recovery effort. Now we know how to do it for next year. What, what that means is that now they've been able to recover the vehicle, mm -hmm. they can get all the data off of it that they needed to, so this was an extremely successful experiment. Yeah. Even though the parachutes didn't go as they wanted, they can get the data they need off of that right. to figure out what happened. They got all the recorders. Freaking awesome. Great job Great to everyone job. there. That's going to be absolutely sweet. Um, all right, before we get into break, two more uh, stories. The Space Launch System Core has completed its critical design review. Uh, basically, on uh, July 1st, the SLS has pass the CDR, uh, Boeing's a prime contractor for this, so we can actually begin work on SLS. Uh, it's a 70 metric ton configuration, uh, and they're ahead of schedule, and hopefully we will actually start flying by the 2017 test flight date. And finally, Oh, uh, so there's going to be an AMA or an Ask Me Anything with Buzz Aldrin on reddit.com. Uh, it'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on July 8th. That's uh, 1900 UTC. Uh, we're pretty sure it's at Reddit slash R slash IAMA uh, because they've started up their IAMA uh, program, which is an uh, I am a fill in the blank here and, and the AMA of course also stands for ask me anything which is kind of a cute little play on words there um, and for those of you counting this is coming right on the heels of commemorating the 45th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing uh, July 20th 1969 so Buzz Aldrin has kind of kick-started this uh, entire social media onslaught, if you will. He's doing the Reddit Ask Me Anything. He has started the uh, hashtag on Twitter, hashtag uh, Apollo 45, I believe it is, which is kind of confusing for some people, but ignore that for a moment. Uh, there's also the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Apollo 45, although no videos yet, but keep your eye on it because I'm sure there will be something 
very, very shortly. And uh, I think that's really cool. You can ask an astronaut, you can ask a moonwalker anything. Like, how crazy is that? One of 12 people who have stepped foot on the moon. Yep, very cool. So uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Chris Radcliffe about Martian habitats. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the welcome back to the show. Uh, I wanted to give a quick thank you to all the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this episode happen. These are the premier. I'm sorry, the the producers of Tomorrow who have helped make this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed at least five dollars to this specific episode to help make it go. Uh, and you can get more information on how to do that at Patreon.com/tm. Are, oh, once again, we are a crowdfunded show, so every single dollar helps. All right, I wanted to thank uh, Chris Radcliffe for taking the time to come on the air and uh, uh, join us to talk about some Martian habitats. Chris is the uh, creator and founder of Space Up, which is an unconference, and he is, uh, we've had dinner with him many times and we've talked about exactly this. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for taking time on your Saturday to come out and uh, talk to us. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's always fun to talk to you. So we, uh, we were browsing, we peruse Reddit from time to time. That's a thing that we do. And we, there was a Redditor who said, uh, Elon Musk proposed SpaceX city on Mars might have something like 80,000 people. What kind of habitat could house such a large number of people? Which is a, a, a good question because when you think Mars habs, you generally think, you know, you see those sci-fi like domes and whatnot. Is that what we've talked about? That is that what we're going to see on Mars? How how are we going to get eighty thousand people on Mars in habitats? Yeah, it was uh, fun to to look at that uh, Reddit conversation because uh, I, I'm interested in uh, cities and I'm also interested in going to Mars. I want to live there someday uh, with my family, and uh, I, I think that we're going to end up in some kind of a city. But when you think about it, it's like, well, what does a Martian city or a Martian town or habitat, whatever you want to call it, look like? Uh, what usually comes up is uh, a dome, and then you think, well, okay, domes, that might be a little hard, so how about like, you know, a series of tubes underground, we'll, we'll dig them underground, and then that, that's pretty much where everybody stops, and that's, that's where they stopped on the Reddit uh, discussion as well. So A, uh, I'm not sure that people will want to live underground for the rest of their lives, um, but, but B, is that really what it's going to look like? Just a series of tubes underground because we can't deal with the radiation. There's further radiation, right? I mean, we can't deal with the radiation. What's it really going right. to look like? Yeah, and so, I mean, there, there are two things that you want to make sure of on Mars that are, are really easy to come by on Earth. And uh, one is that you have pressure. Uh, so basically enough air to breathe. Uh, you're not, you know, constantly, uh, um, you know, eyes bugging out of your head, uh, total recall style. And then the other thing is that um, you want to have protection from radiation. Those are kind of the two big uh, problems to deal with. But once you get past those two problems, um, in the words of uh, Pilonaut, um, we're going to take our humanity with us wherever we go. And so beyond that, our cities, our towns, our places to live are going to look a lot like they do now. And so we'll have some challenges to like let's take um, underground for instance. Uh, if you if you're picturing like a hallway, a little tube, and you're kind of walking down the tube, and your bunks along one side, I've actually seen renderings that that's how they imagine people are going to be living. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to accept that for even a minute. But if you picture, you know, let's say you've got an underground hallway. I'm going to call it a hallway for for just a second. And off the hallway, you've got um, basically connections to a house and another house. And so now your hallway isn't really a hallway, it's a street. Uh, it's a pedestrian street, it's small, but it's small the way that say a, a street in Venice would be small or um, actually uh, Karen just, was just pointing out, there's this great book called Built to Last. That's all <laughs> you about have props, that's awesome. <laughs> 
Say again? You have props. That's awesome. Oh, totally, yeah. And um, so one of the things is castles have... Oh, this is going to be a fun one to try to do. Castles have this um, kind of vault structure. And so you see this over and over again in our past where you have archways with vaults and then people's living off of the vaults or off of the archways. Sometimes you call them arcades before that became, you know, more awesome as a video arcade. But um, uh, these are these patterns that we see throughout history that I think are going to repeat, especially if we pay attention to what's worked in history. So what you're saying is that rather than these really huge glass domes that uh, won't survive micrometeoroid impacts and won't actually uh, protect you from radiation, and rather than underground tubes that would be really depressing to live in for the rest of your life, what we'll probably end up seeing is pretty much what we have here on Earth, just slightly tweaked for Mars. Yes, and that's really the way to, to think about it, is that we have things that are on Earth that work. And so if we can recognize what works, look, at for, look for the patterns, because obviously the street you live on and the street I live on, they don't look a lot alike. And say um, a, a small town in North Africa looks very different, or um, a spot uh, like the Mall of America type um, sort of uh, glassed in sort of city that also looks very different. But if you look at what's similar about those things, the patterns that uh, um, tie them together, we'll take those patterns with us and we'll still apply them on Mars. So what happens after, what happens timeline-wise? So we, we first get to Mars and you're not gonna have a huge community of anything. These are the first six humans. They're probably gonna be leaving in a little tin can. How do we grow that out and where does that grow to? Yeah, I've actually thought about that a lot um, because my ideal would be that from the moment we touch down, those first six people, and, and I'm talking about the ones who are there permanently, so you'll, you'll have people coming and going, but the ones who are there to stay should think of themselves as the first house on the block. And that tin can, that tin can is their house. So now instead of, uh, I mean, I've seen some of the, I think it's the Mars One renderings where um, you've got a, a tin cans in a line. I think they might be red dragons and they kind of connect them with tubes and, and then you're done. It's the tube again. And, and I, I think that's a kind of a weird way to look at it because if you think about it, it's like, okay, I'm going to go visit Ben and Carrie Ann and I'm going to have to pass through somebody else's house in order to do it. But if you line them up the same way as though they were houses on a street, then what you want to do is build the street because you still want a shirt sleeve environment that you can go and visit your neighbors for you know a cup of tea or to borrow some sugar without really, you know, you don't have to suit up for that. So if you take the tube and you just push it outside and that's your street front that each of these tin cans are connected to, then the first one that lands is the first. You don't really have to build a tube. The second one, the third one, um, you land them close, and then maybe something like um, an athlete. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, JPL's athlete program. It's a way of moving habitats um, so that where you land isn't where you stay. Uh, you just line them up. And then, uh, uh, you know, maybe a human height tube, even something you'd have to crawl through because, you know, we'll put up with some, some troubles when we're uh, first there. Uh, you take that, you know, little inflatable tube, maybe using some of the, the Bigelow um, habitat uh, techniques, and you connect up those houses. And so now you, more people land, they arrive, they connect up, and now you've got a good street. What's now the, ask me what happens next. Oh, yeah, I was just going to do that. What's the stage after that? So that's the first stage. And now, all right, we've been there for a while. We've been there for a decade. We keep sending more and more people. Eventually, this kind of sucks because you get this really long tube with all these different habitats on it. And you need to get from tube one to tube 4,000. It, it's going to take you the better part of a day. So what's the next step after that? So now the next step is that you really start thinking, okay, we're acting as though it's a street. Let's turn it into a real street. Again, it's a pedestrian street. It's probably pretty small. You've got a line of houses on the other side. Some of them might be uh, the, the tuna cans that you landed in. Some might be these great um, concrete dome structures or, or that kind of thing that you're, you're building with your, your um, native materials. 
Uh, but you've got a, a, a nice street lined up, and it's not really going anywhere. You've been there for you know four or five years. It's stable. And so now you can build that arcade over your street where your tube was. Now that arcade, I mean, if you're picturing an archway and it's you know small, think again. Think of something that's more like two or three stories tall, big windows near the top to let a lot of light in. And so that is now your street. And on both sides of that street are those same houses. And they start to build in a little bit to the sides. And so now you've got pressure in the middle, surrounded by pressure. And then on the back side, maybe you've got gardens that are also pressurized. And so you start creating a bigger and bigger pressurized area that grows and grows very much like a city. So you, you turn the corner when you get down a block, you have another corner at that block, and you start building down that way. So you build out from there. Then do we build more of these cities? Is there a point where we break away and say, okay, great, city, you know, the city of Radcliffe is now done. Can we move on to, and I, I hereby propose that the first city in Mars is known as the city of Radcliffe. Do we move on to um, other cities and other areas of Mars? And then if so, how do we link them together? Right, so um, that's a great segue into this other book that I love. Um, it, it's called Car Free Cities, but um, the basic idea is that, and, and he's even got it helpfully on the back cover here, so um, you start with these little round areas. I don't even know if any of that's coming through. But you start with these little round areas, each one of which is about the size of a town. Picture about 7,000 people. And then um, the center of town is your um, basically transit node. And I'm thinking that on Mars, that's probably going to be you all pile into some kind of bus or something, and, and it'll take you down to the next one. Uh, hyperloop, but, um, I think, is the term you're looking for, hyperloop. Yes, actually, hyperloop is exactly the term I was looking for. Thank you. So uh, your hyperloop um, station is at the center of town. And the town is small enough that you know you could walk there in five minutes You know, down your, your series of tubes or tunnels or whatever you have at that point. You get to the hyperloop station, and then you go to the node that is where Ben and Carrie Ann live. Uh, actually, I'm saying you, and then I'm saying you're going to... Anyway, so you go to that node, you get out, and then you walk five minutes. So Hyperloop does you know, the, the, the long-haul transit, and you're walking for the short-haul transit, and you're all set. Now, I mean, I don't think it's all going to work that way, because something tells me that not everybody's going to want to live in the same place. But if you consider that half of humanity lives in cities right now, and we'll probably have about that same ratio when we get to Mars, then you're talking about of the 80,000 people that you're trying to transport, you know, you're talking about 40,000 people, which is a couple of good sized cities. You know, the, the Disney nerd in me uh, thinks of this, and I, I look at uh, what Walt Disney work, was working on for Progress City in Epcot, which was pretty much that model of you have the monorail, the high speed transportation between the major cities. Then you've got the people mover, which moved you inside of the cities at a much slower rate, but on a personal level. Uh, and then that would drop you off within just a few minutes of pedestrian only traffic with no automobiles anywhere inside of your journey. You were always lifted away from all of those elements. It seems like he was way ahead of his time and on the wrong planet. Uh, but other than that, it seems like that's what you're talking about, where you've got this kind of mass transit loop, and then you jump onto another transit system that drops you off right at the kind of the other kind of centralized area, and you just kind of walk the rest of the way. Uh, and that seems like a fairly doable thing on Mars. We just need to figure out at this point construction. Uh, some people are in the chat room mentioning, can you do like 3D construction on a massive scale? Or is this just stuff we're going to have to bring with us? Yeah, and I think we're, we're going to have to do some um, living off the land, not just in terms of the materials that we're using, but also the, the construction techniques. If you look at, um, we think of log cabins as this kind of primitive frontier sort of living, but at the very same time, New York City was being built up, and it was being built up into these tall brick buildings, but you didn't have folks in frontier communities, say like in Wisconsin, like on Little House on the Prairie, they weren't building these tall brick structures because they didn't need to, but also because that's not what they had, and so we'll, we'll go to Mars, and we'll start with what we've got, which is a tin can. 
and you're going to be living in a tin can for a while because the first thing you do when you land is going to be to try to figure out what's going on and not to, to start building. Um, but then once you've built up a, enough people to help, you can start developing some, some construction techniques. And that's also something that we can do here. So um, at uh, the Space Ops, he's talked about it, and at the Mars Society, and I can't remember his name, but he's come up with some great Martian concrete uh, that really takes into account both what you have on Mars and also the, the environment. You're going to be dealing with this very dry environment that isn't, uh, you, can, you can make some trade-offs with that. And so using that Martian concrete uh, with what you've got, you could then play around with is like, do you want to be making bricks? Do you want to be making walls? Do you want to be forming things, um, or uh, uh, using some kind of you know enormous three D printer? Actually, it's going to be really cool because Mars is a different planet. It does have different characteristics, including gravity and the atmosphere. We'll be able to do different things with construction that maybe you couldn't do here on Earth. It opens up yeah. a whole new world of possibilities. It could be pretty cool. Um, before we go into break, and this kind of exceeds the level of what we're talking about, but maybe you have a clever idea on this. Um, Dave1959 asked, how is all of this funded? Right, yeah. Um, I think a lot of it's going to have to be self-funded. Um, this is, again, yeah, it's getting into my own personal beliefs about how this will fly. Um, it's not really going to profit many people back on Earth for a while to uh, send folks to Mars. And so you will need to figure out a way to bring what you can and then make it last. And so you get there, and you've got your tin can, and you've got you know, the equivalent of the, those uh, plastic pails and things that you would use at the beach to, to make bricks and that kind of thing. And that's it. And you need to build everything up from there. So pack carefully and <laughs> do it yourself. Pack carefully. Buy what you need on Mars. Don't, don't bring it with you. Just buy it, buy it at your local Martian target. Uh, Chris, exactly. I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, Space Up, actually, plug Space Up really quick because I think this is where we talked about this, and the reason I thought bringing you on is because of Space Up, because this is a topic that comes up constantly in Space Ups. Yeah, Space Up UK is actually happening this weekend in London. Um, I actually, I'm not sure if it's a two day or a one day thing, um, but they've done a really great job already, and they've had a lot of uh, great conversations. And really what Space Up is, is you get together and you have a conversation just like what we had, and uh, you talk about what's interesting to you at the time, and so, you just make sure that there are awesome people, and I bet there are awesome people near you, wherever you happen to be. And uh, you get together and you uh, talk about awesome spacey things. I'm excited for the spa first Space Up Mars that happens with the, on the first colony of Mars as they get together and they talk about space on Mars and what the right. next steps of humanity are going to be after Mars. That's going to be cool, and that will be a thing. It's going to be yes. awesome. All right, totally. Chris, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay with us, we'll be right back. One, zero, lift off. The fleet of space shuttles were doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Uh, I wanted to thank all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped to make this segment of this episode go. These are the people who've contributed at least one dollar to this specific episode. That's right, you can contribute as little as a dollar, that's less than a cup of coffee per episode to your local Starbucks to help make a show about space and the cosmos happen. You can get more information on all of this at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O, and I do love how this uh, continues to grow uh, week after week after week. We continue to get more people. We are $50 per episode away from our next goal. Uh, we already got, for this last goal, we were able to get our Dutta cam. I'm gonna make them really quickly jump to the Dutta cam. Here you go. You're, this is mostly for After Dark for those of patrons. Hi, Dutta. Hi, Dutta. <laughs> uh, so we now have a, a camera in the control room. And the great thing about that camera is Dutta can now jump on camera and tell me when I'm being an idiot and uh, not actually uh, doing something correctly. So Ben, you're being an idiot. You're See, there you go. Idiot. There you go. All right. Uh, let's get started with some uh, comments from this last show. First one is from James. Uh, James Moore, who commented on Patreon. <laughs> that was awesome. Hi, Chris. <laughs> 
Duh duh. <laughs> duh duh. There we go. From James. From Patreon says, uh, oh, well, this is talking about how to get, uh, how to be a space ambassador, right? So how to uh, talk to other people about space and your enthusiasm. And he says um, that there are other approaches as well, depending on how comfortable you are talking with other people. By the way, I'm not that outgoing, but I am passionate about space, so I feel very comfortable talking about it. Getting involved in a local astronomy club or NASA's Night Sky Network or even JPL's Solar Sister Solar System <laughs> Ambassador <laughs> Program. The Solar this is Sister be a great Program segment. is a completely different thing. Um, are great ways to get your feet wet and have a support system behind you. There are lots of other groups and organizations out there as well. Absolutely. And actually, I would say, uh, you know, we are just talking to Chris uh, Radcliffe of Space Up fame. Actually, Space Up is another great way. Uh, if you're just a partial space geek, when you go into space up, you'll be kind of a space geek. When you come out, you'll be a hardcore space geek. You will love it. Even if you don't understand all the three-letter acronyms or the TLAs, it doesn't matter. It's about, it's like, the people who are passionate about space are a, a really great group of people yeah. who are uh, interested in advancing humanity. So, um, yeah, you know, just talking about it, I think, is, is as James kind of said, is a great way. Totally. Uh, all right. Uh, this is from Arif. I hope so, because otherwise it's ARF. <laughs> All right. What's ARF say? <laughs> also commenting from Patreon. Um, you know, talking to kids is great. It's fun telling them that they are... It's fun telling them that they are at the age... There we go. That they will have an incredible things to look forward to in their lifetime. They can plan to be things like asteroid miners or colonists of another planet and have a real chance of it happening. They can dream. Oddly enough, I've had good luck with parents of my children's friends, too. Yeah, so it's it's the whole reason that tomorrow's here is because, you know, I lost that flame, mm -hmm. right? The the excitement for space, I lost that in high school, and I, and um, it took the space shuttle retiring to get that back. And I think once you kind of you kind of spark that inside of people again, they, they even with their kids, they start going, oh, th this is really, I didn't realize, mm -hmm. suborbital, I can go to space? Right. I can, I can go, I can see the curvature of the Earth in a balloon. I'm not going to say you can go to space in a balloon because you can't do that. But, you know, I can see the curvature of the Earth in a balloon ride. Right. I mean, that's, that's really that's really awesome stuff. Yeah. So it's you know getting to the parents through the kids is one great way to do it. Um, yeah. No, that's the end of that th end of that thought. Okay. <laughs> We're done there. Great. Uh, next comment comes from Stephen Grimsley, also commenting from Patreon. Here's an idea. When you go to Mars and you need to slow down so you don't crash, but you want to conserve energy, and for that reason you don't use thrusters, could you use solar sails to slow down, or would you be facing the wrong way? Yeah, you kind of be... F so, let's just say you did use solar sails, and let's just say that the sun was on the opposite side of where you're trying to go, so it's the, the solar rays are pressing against you, you're, you're going towards the sun, right. and Mars is in between, and you're put, right? Even if you had a solar sail, the, the amount of energy that you get from a solar sail isn't remotely close enough to decelerate a vehicle going at 22,000 plus miles per hour okay. into something, you, you, you need a lot more to slow you down mm -hmm. uh, than a solar sail. Or I suppose you could use something that was so freakishly huge that it's not reasonable anymore. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that it's so freakishly huge that it's not reasonable anymore. Right. Yeah. So interesting idea. I just don't, I don't think of, and it also requires that the sun be in the right location, right? Because right. if the sun is behind you and pressing on you that way, now it's actually speeding you up and not slowing ah, you down. Yeah. So kidding. yeah, a lot of things that kind of need to be there. Don't don't think of it like a sail that you like a sailboat where you can kind of catch the wind right. and, and move around. It kind of has to all be pointing in the right direction, so to speak. Interesting idea, though. I figured yeah. I'd, I'd figure out an answer as best I know. And, and by the way, if you're a rocket scientist uh, and you're like Ben, you're an idiot. Here's how you do it. Please correct me, but that, as, as I know it, that's how that would work. Cork's been in the chat room, says uh, Space Anchor. Space Anchor. <laughs> All right. Throw the anchor off the Just... side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got me to snort. Thomas, Thomas. Oh, Thomas Cheney, uh, commenting from Patreon, says, First, I think you're wrong about waiting. Columbus should have totally waited for nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, and Lindbergh should have waited for the Concorde before attempting his solo flight. I do hope the sarcasm is self-evident. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I agree. I 100% agree with that statement of if you wait for the thing, mm -hmm. like if you wait for warp drive before mm -hmm. you go out in the solar system, uh, 
then you'll never you'll never get out there. Right. You'll never develop the technology. You'll always be waiting. You'll always be waiting. And rather than wait, use the technology you have now to do cool things and mm -hmm. awesome things. And yeah, maybe we can't make it to other planets today. Maybe we can't make it all of our solar system today. Right. But we can make it to Mars today. Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby absolutely. steps are important. I think everyone sort of tries to shoot for the moon, and and you know, and that's great. And that, but there's that saying, right? Shoot for the moon, and at the very least, you'll end up in the stars. I, and so you gotta, you have to hope for more, but you have to work that, with what you have. That's a dumb saying, actually. Okay. Well. Because if you shoot for the moon, how are you making it? Because the stars are so much further away. Okay, not on a star, in the stars, in and amongst. Really, we're gonna no. <laughs> <sighs> this from, next one comes from Tom Westcott. <sighs> Your point about whoa, Cal what? <laughs> it was really that long. was a lot of text that just appeared behind me. It was, it's, it's a long. Question or statement. All right, I all guess. right, go ahead, go ahead. You, you pick these. Uh, your point about California is the West Coast in general being more open to space than those from the Midwest relates to an idea I've held for some time that modern migration is acting as a natural genetic selector. Born in LA myself of ultimately mostly European ancestors, someone in each of the past two to six generations had made the deliberate choice to leave behind an established community, family, friends, and head west into the unknown. I don't think this is enough to make us candidates for homo evolutis, but it should be enough to qualify us for as a new mongrel breed with our own particular pattern of psychological fur. I believe you will find us descendants of recent pioneers heavenly represented in Mars and other space colonies. So the idea being that the people who have chosen to migrate further west yes. and go into the unknown are the ones that's genetically bred into us and we will then likely be the ones that go to Mars first as opposed to some of the people who are in the Midwest who just were like mm, I'm done we stopped or on the East Coast who were like yay new land we we out right sure is that the is that kind of I, the... I think that's where he's going yes yeah it's an interesting concept but where do you draw that line because anyone who's in America right. that came from over from Europe well they already made the choice to kind of go and do the initial really hard I guess it journey. comes down to fundamentally why that choice was made mm -hmm. right because you didn't have to come all the way to America to escape England, right? You could have gone the other way, man. I don't know. I actually don't know. Could you? Well, sure. Why not? There's land there, isn't there? They didn't have to cross a whole flipping ocean to get away from their oppressors. Hmm. Right? I mean... So, yeah, I guess I guess it depends on why they decided to come. Right? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's a genetic trait of people. that not Like something built into our DNA that wants us, you, like we need to explore and get out there. Right, but there's the, just we need personality. to explore to get out there. Or there's the, I feel like I'm being oppressed. F this, I'm out. Right. right? I mean, it's, there's a lot of different reasoning behind why you're going to... That's, where you're going. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting concept. Uh, curious to know what you guys... Let's can, Continue that conversation in our chat rooms. I'm curious to know what you guys think and how, whether you think there's a weight behind that one. Uh, this, oh man, this is going to be another one. This comes from Marcus. Oh, <laughs> Marcus is adorable. And I want to say hello to Marcus and thank you very much for watching tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's very, very cool. Um, however, um, you're going... <laughs> I'm going to stumble on this one. I'm just going to tell you guys right now. Uh, because Mar Marcus is a 14-year-old boy from Sweden. Yes, and so, so English uh, is not a first language. Here and you go. 14 year old means I don't want to capitalize anything. <laughs> and and acronyms. Lots just, of acronyms. Just, so here just you go. Here stay you go. with me as much as here possible. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, from Marcus Wogberg. I'm a 14-year-old boy from Sweden. Before 2014, I wasn't interested in space at all. The only thing I knew was that Apollo 11 brought Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon and didn't even know that Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. I started watching KSP, which is Kerbal Space Program, on YouTube and heard one of them talking about Mars One and check it out and searching on YouTube about it and found TMRO slash Space Vidcast. The idea of going to Mars fascinating and got Hawk on TMRO <laughs> Space and SpaceX and now I know all the big things. I know about ISS, International Space International Space Station. Space Station, thank you. Curiosity, Opportunity, Spirit, Soyuz, Space Shuttle, Mars Express, Venus Express, MRO, which is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MO, which could be a lot of different things, uh, Venera Probes, Mariner Probes, Voyager 1 and 2, Cassini, I think you get the point. And yes, you got to say Marcus Wogberg. <laughs> First off, again, thank you for watching the show. Uh, I do think it's really cool uh, when uh, people get hooked at a younger age yeah. and get excited about the cosmos. 
Uh, you just hear stories over and over and over again. From uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a good story mm -hmm. about that as well. I think we have some fairly interesting stories. I know that there are other people in the chat room as well uh, who have uh, interesting stories as uh, also. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Haldesk MO could be Mars One. Um, it could be micro observatory. Yeah, it could uh, be a lot of different things. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. really sure. I kind of sorry. Yeah, I she tried said, to spell she it said as what's MO stand for? I'm like, well, I need context because it could be this, 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 this. I was like, oh, well, we don't have context. So. Nope. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, it, it was interesting because we're trying to read this and we're like, we feel old because of the uh, uh, just the just the difference in thought. But it's yeah, awesome. It, yeah, def <laughs> Marcus definitely grows up in a world of Twitter. Yes. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. We did not. No. Nope. <laughs> We are old. Yep. All right. Uh, this one comes from Jan. Jan? Jan? Uh, uh, yes. Also coming from Patreon. Uh, the best way I know so far was, like you mentioned, to point out the International Space Station. Before Space Shuttle launches was also something cool where people thought they cannot see it live. But my wife got a good comment related to the Space Shuttle era. When she saw the various trucks coming on land side before the landing, she was telling me the Transformers are coming to meet their boss. Which turns out to be very cool things to say to kids to introduce them to space. It may not be technically exact, but the blend of imagination and reality would make kids and maybe older be curious and interested in asking, start asking questions. I love the idea of blending um, imagination and actual science kind of together. Yeah. Because it, sometimes it takes that imagination and not knowing that you have limits to force yourself out of preconceived limits that don't actually exist. Yes. If, right? Yes. What we were smiling and about to laugh at me. What were you going to say? I, I was hoping you would say that just a spark of imagination. <laughs> really? Really? You were so close, though. I was not trying to be Figment the Dragon from Disney. I don't see why not. Anyway, All uh, right. so next, next one comes from Doug Space off of TMRO.TV. I googled, quote, NASA spin-offs and found that there's actually an extensive database of them. Check this one out. Did any of us know the connection between NASA and bank terminals? Space-related -re technology is actually all around us. And we'll add that link into the show notes because, holy cow, you're not going to be able to <laughs> type that from the video itself. No, so not so we'll much. Make, yeah, we'll add that to the show notes so you can click on it. <laughs> and our final comment from this week, which leads us into next week. Yay! comes from Moonminer, also from TMRO.TV. Uh, as far as waiting for X before Y, I'd rather wait for Vasmir before going to Mars because cutting down on the transit time will reduce the exposure to radiation. And we are going to be talking to the CEO and founder of Vasmir uh, on next week's show as well. So if you have questions that you'd like us to ask, uh, certainly send those over to Benjamin at tmro.tv. It'll be a live interview, as all of our interviews are, mm -hmm. and it should be a lot of fun. So this is a next generation space propulsion technology uh, that will help us get to other planets, hopefully in a much faster amount of time it's, uh, it's Think of it as Hyperloop for space. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how that applies, but all right, we'll go. We'll go with that. Yeah. All right. I want to thank everyone so much for watching this week. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, if you're watching live, stay with us. After Dark is up next. Uh, if you're not a member of uh, Patreon, consider joining at three dollar level or more. This is one thing we're planning on doing, which is we are going to make After Dark available to anyone in Patreon that's at three dollars or higher. Now, for those of you that are one dollar level, you're like, no. Don't worry. The actual plan here is to make it available $3 or more for one month. And then after one month, after the After Dark episodes are one month old, we will release them to everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you're a pat uh, patron of tomorrow mm -hmm. at $3 or more, a patron plus member, uh, you will be able to get After Dark immediately. Everyone else, whether you're a patron or not, mm -hmm. you'll be able to get After Dark, but you'll have to wait a month to be able to see the episodes. So you're going to get a lot later than everyone else. Uh, let me know what you think of that idea. We're going to potentially start trying that out soon here. Uh, I think it's a fair way. It gives people who maybe don't even have a dollar, but they're still interested in space. That way they're not limited any content. Right. Uh, but it, well, not that After Dark's all that. It is what it is. So um, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Please join us next week. Follow us on live stream for more information. Sign up at patreon.com slash TMRO and follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash space vidcast. We're working on changing that. And um, see you in a week.